So, Dr. Weinstein, you came here looking for a fight. Uh, Mr. Pajot made a response video to, oh yeah, to um, something you said in the, on the Joe Rogan experience. Um, do you have anything to say? Oh, glad you're asking that. I, I was hoping it would come up. Um, so, I don't know how many people have seen the video and what it's responding to, but the short version is that I said something on the Joe Rogan podcast about um, there being... Uh, different kinds of truth that I, I argued for something I call metaphorical truth, that something can be literally false, but it can contain wisdom. And the way you know is that if you act as if it were true, you come out ahead of where you would if you act according to the fact that it's false. And I then said that um, scientific truth is the top truth in the hierarchy. And um, the response was that it was arrogant of me to, to say that there was a top truth that, you know, effectively, from what position do I do that? And, yeah, I can, uh, you want to go ahead that's and clean a, I just want to say that's not the argument. Okay. The argument is that there was a performative contradiction in your, in your statement because you, taught, you said that factual truth is higher than metaphorical truth. But then to say that there's a top-level truth or that there's an overarching truth is to use a metaphorical structure to, to demonstrate where you're placing your truth. And so within the statement, there was, a, there was a performative contradiction in terms of you have to resort to metaphorical truth to speak of hierarchy because all the language of hierarchy is metaphorical. And therefore, to place factual truth at the top of that hierarchy is a performative contradiction. So that's my argument. So I will, um, I will plead guilty to using metaphor to defend my position because, of course, language is composed of metaphors, both living and dead, and it's really hard to communicate anything without running afoul of that standard. But um, I will defend, um, in spite of that guilt, I will defend the idea that scientific truth is the top truth in the hierarchy, and the reason is really simple. Um, it's because there is no mechanism for sorting between metaphorical truths that belong to different traditions and are in conflict with each other. So, in other words, if we take two, like um, behave well, when you die, you go to heaven. That's cool. You should do that. Um, on the other hand, if you behave well in a Brahman Atman system, you may be reincarnated as something better than you are now. That's also cool, but it's not the same truth, right? So you can't sort out. These are both kinds of wisdom, and I think we know exactly what kind of wisdom they are, or at least we should, which is if you behave so as to be reincarnated as something better or to go to heaven, what it will do is in all probability it will leave your descendants really well positioned in their um, in their culture. And that means that your genes, which you might not have been in a position to say anything about, will be well positioned to persist and spread because your descendants will be well placed. So in effect, going to heaven or being reincarnated as something better than you were are stand-ins for a genetic truth that we can't say. And so what I'm arguing is that what makes the scientific truth hierarchically superior is that it explains all the subordinate truths in a way that is logically consistent, whereas if you were to prioritize heaven as a truth, then you would have to say, well, reincarnation is therefore false, or you would have to have them all simultaneously be true in some unreconcilable way. So the only one that has the special characteristic of accounting for all the others is the scientific truth. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to get into this now. <laughs> so I think that what you just did was nested your claim for the validity of scientific truth within a pragmatic framework, which is what I claimed when I was talking to Sam Harris was necessary, because you said, I believe, that the justification for um, for assuming the truth of the of the uh, of the mythological representation was its effect on on something that's associated with the Darwinian process, right? And that's how you used to that's how, what you used to justify your claim that it was in fact true. So, um, in the discussion that you're referencing, my point. So my point was essentially that there is something called metaphorical truth and that it's a real thing. So I was, I'm in agreement with you on that. Where we might be in disagreement is that there is simultaneously a thing that I would call literal truth or scientific truth. And by the way, I'm not saying that what scientists say is in this category inherently. Scientists can be wrong. But the point is truth that is scientifically verifiable that makes predictions 
has a special priority in this hierarchy because it is the one objective version. It is not contingent on being nested in another in a series of, of beliefs. So what if it's a scientific truth that's metaphorically wrong? Oh, and there are like I can give you an example. Okay, so I read this the memoirs of a KGB scientist, KGB agent who worked with the Russians in this uh, biochemical lab, and their job was to meld um, Ebola with smallpox because smallpox is Ebola is not that contagious, and so that's kind of annoying if you're trying to kill people. Whereas smallpox, but it's really fatal. Whereas smallpox is really contagious, so if you could get the two together and then develop an aerosol spray, you could kill a lot of people. And in fact, they did kill about 500 Russians by mistake when some of what they were doing escaped. But it isn't obvious to me that that's an invalid scientific pursuit. But I do think that it's an invalid ethical pursuit. And so that seems to me to indicate that the ethical pursuit supersedes the scientific pursuit with regards to truth claim. So... Um. I'm going to disagree with you. I would say it doesn't supersede with respect to the truth claim. It supersedes with respect to considerations of behavior and policy. So I absolutely agree with you. There are plenty of scientific truths that are deeply unfortunate. And I'm, I want to take what you said, the first thing that you said. Okay. If you're good, you die and you go to heaven. If you're good, you die and you're reincarnated as a higher being. Those two things are the same, okay, in terms of their effect. They are restating of the hierarchy. The hierarchy, religion is all about the hierarchy. That's what religion is about. The, the restating of the hierarchy in those two terms have the same effect in terms of what we're saying, is that if you're good, you will not meld those two things together. And that is the hierarchy. The hierarchy itself is the capacity to be above quantitative, uh, purely quantitative considerations. Uh, uh, considerations and to apply qualitative thinking. And the whole language of hierarchy is all a language about a movement from, from quantity up to quality. Like the, it's, it's movement it's a, going up a mountain. It's going up the base and then going up to, un, to unity. And when you stand in that top place, then you can look down and you can judge what facts, because there are, there are, there is an, an innumerable amounts of facts. There's an infinite quantity of facts. You can decide which facts are worth pursuing. And so that's what religion is, and that's what the hierarchy is. And so if you take, a, if you take qualitative, if you take a, a quantitative tidbit of information, and you say that is above, let's say, qualitative judgment, how do you even, why, why are you even focusing on that quantitative uh, data? Because there's, there's an infinite amount of them. So you have to have a, ma a manner by which you focus on something. And that is the hierarchy, and that is the whole language of, of the religious hierarchy. So, yeah. so what do you do where religious traditions and what I'm calling metaphorical truths conflict? So let's say mating systems. I would argue that monogamy is a superior mating system because it does not sideline any significant population of males. If you sideline a significant population of males by having uh, what biologists would call a polygynous system or people would generally call a polygamous system, if you do that, then you have sexually frustrated males who are left over and inevitably become something like a marauding horde or an army or something immoral like that. Now, wait, wait. Now, you're assuming that's bad. Yes. And so you're falling into Jonathan's trap. Because you're saying, you see, you have this a priori framework that monogamy is better because you've already decided what constitutes bad. You can't help but lay a moral framework over your selection of facts. And so that, I mean, I'm not trying to trap you. I know this is a right. crazily complicated problem. Yeah. But, but the idea that you, that, that the fundamental idea is that you can't select the damn facts and order them, which you have to do. You have to do it without applying an a priori moral framework. Right. So I would say 
I am applying an a priori moral framework. I am not treating this as a, I mean, you, you know, we could also look at the behavior of people as a physical process. It's equally a physical process as it is a moral behavioral process. I'm not doing that. I'm being a human being and I'm saying from the point of view of values that probably everybody in this room would share, it is not desirable to have sexually frustrated young men roving around being violent because they can't find a mate because some other highly placed males in the society have many mates. That's not a good thing. That's not me speaking factually, that's me speaking morally. But my point is, my point is not that that's what should come out of this conversation. My point is different religions that contain metaphorical truths differ over what a viable reproductive strategy is. In other words, Christianity prioritizes monogamy. Modern Judaism does too, but the Torah does not. So, okay, okay. so, so how, okay, so your claim is that because it's very difficult to adjudicate between competing moral systems, that science is preferable with regards to truth claims because there's a way of adjudicating between scientific truths. But I would say the mere fact that it's difficult to adjudicate between competing moral claims doesn't indicate, therefore, that science is a higher truth. It just indicates that science has an advantage when it comes to comparison that ethical systems don't. Right. It doesn't mean that ethical systems are perfect. No, no. I, 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 so this is one of these places where I don't exactly know what I'm running afoul of and why. I think m my brain is built around some sort of model that makes it hard for me to understand why we could possibly be disagreeing over this. My point is, <laughs> you have a thousand different belief systems. They're all built out of metaphorical truths and a certain amount of real truth. Let's just stick science in with the rest of them. It's, it's belief system a thousand and one. Okay, now let's say, well, which of these is best? How are you even going to do that? There's only one of them that has a distinct characteristic. It's number a thousand and one. What's its distinct characteristic? It explains why all the others work. So how is it not, just by virtue of the fact that it does something that nothing else can, how is it not the top one in the hierarchy? We have run a little bit past eight. Uh, would, <laughs> uh, would, would you all want to, would you all be interested in getting together for a, uh, you can organize, you can organize debate like a little tag team, Peterson Pajau versus Weinstein Harris. 